Hi everybody, welcome back to my video series on how to build an HO scale layout from start to finish. This is part three of the video series and this one will be a little shorter than the first two. Uh, what we're going to do in this series or this video is we're going to add all of the Digitrax components, the um, UP5 control panel, all of the power cords, the SCHC. We're going to get all of those pieces in place and we're going to get them connected with LocoNet. And at the very end of this video, we're going to connect everything to the Digitrax Zephyr Express DCC system. So the first thing I'm going to install is this um, UP5 Universal uh, Panel 5 control panel. On my regular layout, I have a, a Digitrax um, Super Chief DCC system and it has a DT402 throttle. The um, Zephyr Express basically just has one throttle knob so you can run one locomotive with it. I'm going to put this control panel in mostly because if I wanted to run two different trains at a time or if I'm, you know, if somebody wants to program with the, um, the Zephyr Express, I can still run trains with using the throttle from my other system or you can buy a separate throttle, whatever works for you. This is absolutely not necessary. Um, one of the things that I do like about this, it has a, an LED right there between these two um, uh, phone jacks. So when the track power's on, this LED will light up and then I'll actually be able to see the track status with this. So it's just a visual indicator that um, we have track power applied to the layout. So very straightforward installation on this. Um, I, I pre-measured this out to where I want it, sort of centered it um, based upon where I'm gonna do my LED panel here. And obviously you can't cut into the side of the bench work here. So this is a two and a half inch by one and a half inch opening. Uh, I'm gonna turn the camera off. I'm just gonna use a little handsaw, cut this opening out and I'll come back and we'll get the UP5 installed. Okay, now that we've got the uh, hole cut out for the, for, the, um, for the actual module itself, the module's held on by the face plate. So the next step is to get the face plate where we want it. You notice I just pre, tape this with a couple pieces of masking tape. Whoops, sorry about bumping the camera. And basically I'm just going to tape it where I want it, make sure it's nice and flush, or nice and even I should say. So I'm gonna tape that in place and I'm just gonna do a couple pilot holes here, drill some Pilot holes for the screws. And now I just have these three quarter inch black screws that I'm going to go ahead and screw the control panel on. So we got the face plate installed. So now we're going to, there's two pre-installed screws on the, on the front of the UP5 and we need to remove them completely. I'm sorry, this is the back of the UP5. The black screws are the front. Sorry about that because that's where the LED is. You can see the LEDs right there. So let's remove these two black screws. And what we're going to do is bring this in from the back side of the panel. Get it all lined up here. Go. 
this one on here. So now, how this works is, I'm gonna shut the camera off here and we'll come in from the top side. All right, I apologize if there's a lot of motion here. So these two here are local net cable in. So what I'm gonna do, my DCC system will sit right here. I'm gonna run a local net cable back up along here, plug this in here. This is a local net out, so I'm gonna run this. I'm gonna park the LNWI somewhere back in this part of the layout. And I'm gonna run the local net cable up to the BXP88, and I'm gonna run it across the table to the um, SE8C. Now, if you watch the first part of my videos, you know that I ran a couple feeders off the bus line specifically for the UP5. In order to make that LED work, you have to, um, this has to know the track power is active. The only way to do that is to run some wires from either your track, you can drop a couple extra feeders off the track and go directly to the LNW or the UP5, or you can run a couple extra feeders off your bus line. I chose to run a couple extra feeders off the bus line. There's two screws on the back of here, it doesn't matter the polarity, one just has to be hooked up to red, one just has to be hooked up to black. So I'm going to go ahead and get my wire cutters, get those hooked up, and the UP5 will be installed with the exception of the local net cable. So if you don't want this track status to light up, you don't have to run these wires. It's not necessary to do to make this work. But if you are like me and you like to have that visual representation that track power's on, you gotta run those feeders. So I'm gonna go ahead and get those wired up and we're good to go on the UP5. Okay, so after I got the UP5 installed, I haven't installed any more of the Digitrax uh, modules or anything for this layout. Um, but what I did do, you can see I installed all the power cords. I didn't record installing power cords. There's nothing real attractive about mounting these. You can do them however you want to. This one right here is the uh, power cord for the laptop that's gonna sit right about here. Um, obviously this right here is the power cord for the, um, for the command station. You can see I got a couple wires coming out here. Power cord and USB cable. Did run a USB. This is, this is actually a printer cable. So here's the USB side of it. And here's the square port uh, that plugs into the back of the Digitrax Zephyr Express. Um, right up here, I got a PS14 right there. And that is the power cord for the protothrottle um, receiver. And those two, and I'm going to mount them back over here. So I ran those cables back down here. So now the next step that I'm going to do is I'm gonna go ahead and install the receiver for the proto throttle and the LNWI. This is our Wi-Fi interface, which is going to connect uh, the command station to Wi-Fi and allow us to use the proto throttle. And also I can use the uh, Y throttle uh, digital app on my smartphone. So I didn't show the actual package opening of the LNWI. Um, this actually comes with its own power source, the PS14, which I have run right here. Top of the screen, probably can't see it real well. It also actually comes with a local net cable, and it's, it's only about a two footer, so I don't even think I'll be able to get this hooked up back to my command station, which is fine, because I'm gonna make some, some local net cables when I get all this stuff installed. One thing I want to be aware of, these are designed to be mounted with number four screws. So I just have some number four wood screws here. I think they're a quarter inch, half inch, sorry, half inch um, number four wood screws. If you look real careful, and I know it's hard to see on camera, there's actually a gap between these prongs for the screw holes and where the bottom of the actual LNWI is. So what you need to be careful of when you're mounting these you can't over tighten them because if you do, you're gonna break these off. So uh, just be aware of that before you go ahead and start mounting. So the mounting of this is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to set it where I want it, have a pencil, I'm just gonna mark where I want my holes. I'll go ahead and pre-drill these out. So 
see my four marks there. So I'm gonna go ahead and pre-drill those out. I will actually put these two screws most of the way in, and that way I have something to, to latch the LNWI to. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, get those two screws mounted, and I'll come back and get the rest of it mounted. Okay, so you can see I got those two screws mounted there. This will just sit right over top of it. And again, I got these pre-drilled out, so I just have to get it set. See that's nice and snug. The barrel connector just plugs right in there. And voila, we have the LNWI almost ready to go. I still have to run local net cable uh, to it to get it to connect to the command station. But otherwise that is in, installed and in place and ready to go. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to install the wireless receiver for my proto throttle, which I'm gonna be able to use with this layout as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab that and we'll get that mounted right next to the LNWI. So if you're a regular viewer of my YouTube channel, you know that I have a proto throttle. Um, shame, shameless plug for these guys. This is a great product. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. To get it to work, you need a uh, receiver that will connect with your uh, DCC system and also talk with the actual proto throttle itself. So this particular receiver, you have to purchase the one for your DCC system. This one uses, uh, this is um, compatible with the ESU control cabs, JMRI, Wi-Fi, uh, the JMRI Wi-Fi throttle and the Digitrax LNWI. So, Technically, I could have run this with my um, my uh, uh, JMRI, but I have had good luck with the uh, with the with the uh, LNWI Wi-Fi. So this is what comes included in the package: the receiver, uh, USB micro uh, micro uh, uh, storage chip adapter and then the actual power cord which I've already uh, installed. So this does require power and also there is some programming that we have to do to get it compatible. It's, we have to enter the, um, the SSID address from our uh, LNWI to get this to work, but we'll deal with that part later. Uh, what we're gonna deal with now is just getting this mounted. Here's the board um, and basically what there's a there's a um, microchip right in here and oops I'm sorry it's right up here so I'm gonna pull this out eventually program it and then get it set up but right now I'm just worried about getting this mounted and we'll worry about uh, programming it later so we have to hook this bridge connector up to um, this uses a um, XB Wi-Fi so it doesn't actually use like what, the Wi-Fi in your house You can read about it on their website how this all works. I'm not going to claim to be an expert because I'm not So these two hook up like this um, And I did a little pre-testing here How these wires work and I don't want to get too much bend into them I'm not going to mount it on the side here like this uh, Just because I don't want it to mess these wires up I have plenty of room in here, so I'm just gonna mount it on the base of the unit like this, right behind my um, UP5 control panel. So just like I did with my LNWI, I'm gonna mark where the holes are, pre-drill them, and then get this uh, screwed in and set. Okay, so these are all installed. I still have access to my micro um, SD card to be able to pull that out and program it. Um, I'm sure you probably figured this out already, but um, I like to keep things nice and neat pretty type A personality, so I got this nice and secure, so it's not gonna flop around as we move the layout. So this part here is uh, taken care of. So um, I've got a few more things to, to mount before we're ready to do 
the um, the local net cable so let's go ahead and get the next thing mounted so the next thing I'm going to install it's a power source for the LEDs that I'm going to use and what you ha what you see here is I'm using um, from logic rail technologies this is a 12 volt DC power regulator um, most mostly because it's a good clean power source and it's consistent for the LEDs so I'm going to go ahead and get this opened up and I'll show you how it works okay. so it's a pretty simple little device um, it has a barrel plug port in and you have a power supply for it then you can see we have um, positive and negative out there's two leads out um, and then this will actually hook up to this dual bus power bar and it's going to allow me to run 10 feeds off each side both positive and negative and I'm going to use this to power the LEDs for the turnouts that I'm going to wire up to the tortoises when we get to part four of this video when we start uh, doing some of the wiring of the uh, switch machines and the LED control panel. So this is pretty simple. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and mount this. There's four holes here. There's two holes in the bus bar. Um, I'm going to mount it in a manner where this is accessible to uh, the, the barrel plug on the um, power cable. Got a nice big heat sink here um, and I'm going to angle it so I'll have easy, easy access to the bus bar. Okay, so I got this preset where I want it and I pre-drilled some holes out here. So these are just some, again, some number four wood screws. You don't want to screw it too tight because like the LNWI, the board on this is set a little bit higher than some of the pieces holding it up. So you don't want to get it too tight and break the uh, circuit board off. So go ahead and get the number four screws work perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and finish getting this uh, screwed in and then we'll get the bus bar mounted. So we'll get this opened up. The bus bar got this off Amazon. These are actually a little bit tougher to find and I paid probably a little bit more than what I wanted to. This is about a $20 bus bar. Um, these are some number six screws. They just fit right in through there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this just a little bit to the right of where the uh, power supply is. So this is going to sit nice and flush like that. This is strategic because there's going to be wires from here that are going to run up to the tortoise switch machines. So I'm, I'm keeping them pretty close to all the other wires where the um, where the bend in the wires are for the hinge on the bench work. Now really the only thing I have left for this to be hooked up is I'm going to run a positive and negative off of here to one each of the bus. I'm going to start uh, using some labels as well so I kind of know what's what here so I'm going to get my label maker out and it will save confusion later on. But um, that is going to be the power supply for my LEDs. So last two things we have to mount are the LOC programmer and also the SEHC which will control the signaling and then all of the added modules to this layout will be installed and we'll go ahead and get the local net wires hooked up. Okay so next we're going to go ahead and get the LOC programmer installed and this is uh, um, a, a programmer that is um, makes it a lot easier to program ESU decoders. Uh, you can certainly use uh, your JMRI or your programming track. I've had a little bit of better luck using programming track for the LOC sound decoders. However, a LOC programmer, it's specifically designed their software to download. I'll show you that here. Once we get to the uh, setup phase of getting everything configured, you know, there's 
starting to get to be a lot of business going on in here. So there is a um, nine pin plug-in that goes into the back of the low programmer power port and then here are the two uh, outputs for the rails. So I've got the uh, cable and that, and that connects to a USB cable here which will come out the front of the layout to plug into the computer. Power cord, um, this will be predominantly unplugged. When I need to use a low programmer I'm going to plug it in and I'm just going to unplug the, um, the module for the uh, proto throttle. So just to make sure I get this set where I want it, I'm going to go ahead and get the cable plugged in and there's a couple of screws to hold the USB cable in place here. And I'll get the power cord plugged in as well. I'm just going to set this where I want it. There's just a single screw right in the middle of the loop programmer. So we can just tighten this into place. Okay, so that's it nice and solid. And now we'll go ahead and get the wires hooked up. Okay, so I'm just going to trim these wires down here a little bit and strip the ends. wire stripped out and again there's no order that these have to go in black or red they just have to get hooked up I'm gonna put a staple in there just to hold those wires in place and then we're good to go with the look programmer. So again, when it comes time to um, make some changes here, I've got this quick connect. I just push down and pull. That unplugs and I can plug either one of these in. So this one, if you remember, uh, hooks up to the bus line. So this will provide track power to where the programming rail is. This one is program rail A, program rail B that's hooked directly to the Zephyr Express and then this one is hooked up to the low programmer so if I want to do programming I'm going to plug this one in with my either uh, command station or JMRI this one low programmer and this one is one I just want to run locomotives so predominantly that's going to be the one plugged in all right so the very last thing that we need to hook up here is the BXP 88 and we'll get going on that right now so originally, if you remember, I had the BXP88 set up because really my ideal plan was to have it in this configuration because I wanted it to, the um, signals are going to be right up here at the top and I wanted the cables to be able to run off. The problem is, and what I didn't anticipate occurring was the height of all of these plugs. So I wouldn't be able to close the top with the BXP88 here. So I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of an adjustment and move it slightly. So I'm actually gonna mount it, believe it or not, I'm gonna mount it over top of these wires and it'll give me the clearance I need to be able to close the, the top of the lid and have clearance with, with the wires. Um, and I'm just gonna to have to make a 90 degree bend with the wires for the signal. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my BXP88 I'm sorry, not the BXP88, the SE8C out. And we're, we're gonna go ahead and get that mounted. And, and what I'm gonna do to provide um, some gap between the SE8C and those wires is I'm gonna, I'm gonna shim it with some uh, washers. So we'll get going on that right now. So here's the SE8C and it comes in a pretty substantial box, which is not usual for Digitrex packaging. It's usually in a 
it's usually in a plastic bag that's stapled uh, but you can see here here are the contents of uh, the, the box instruction manual we'll pull the BXP 88 out and you can see that there is a connected test signal mast it's an N scale signal mast but it is a test mast and it's already pre-wired with with the 10 cable or the 10 wire cable so we'll set this off to the side and then also here is um, a connecting strip where we're going to have to wire solder some wires on here and we're going to use that to power the BXP88 and also use those to uh, run the turnouts as well. Let's go ahead and get this unpackaged here and here's what the BXP88 looks like. You can see we got four decent sized mounting holes so again I'm going to get this where I want it do a little bit of testing on it to make sure that I can close the lid with this in place and I'm going to go ahead and get this mounted and again I'm going to shim it up with a couple washers. Okay so I got the SA8C mounted where I want it to and when you take a look at the packaging it talks about um, making sure that when we get it we test um, the signal mass that came with it uh, so before I do that I'm going to get the local net cable wired up and then we'll go through the normal setup of this. I still have to get the, the power wires um, soldered to this because it doesn't have a, a barrel plug like a lot of the other Digitrex products. So I'm gonna use the standard PS14 and I have this uh, barrel connector adapter. So I'm gonna plug that into the end of the PS14, run some wires off the back of this and solder them to the two power inputs on the SE8C. So, for right now, we're gonna leave this as it is, but we have all of the modules mounted where we need them to, so now the next step is to go ahead and start making some local net cables. Okay, now we're ready to make the local net cables. And Digitrex makes a local net cable maker. This is about $50. Uh, to me, it's money well spent because you get everything you need to make a local net cable, but you don't have to buy one of these kits to do it. Uh, three things that you absolutely have to have. You have to have a six wire cable most phone most phone cable is only four wire so if you can find some six wire cable it's relatively cheap you can get a 50 foot roll off of, off of the internet for 8 10 12 bucks depending upon where where you can find it it's very important to get rj12 connectors there are six prong connectors again you go to most big box stores they do have these phone jack connectors but they're only four wires instead of six but the key to all of it is making sure that you get the actual crimping tool to make sure that you can uh, get the cables cut and then stripped and in place. So let's go ahead and open this up and see what we got here. Instructions. Um, LT1 detector. Here's the crimping tool that we're going to need. And this is nice because it actually has, if you can see it here, has the cutting blades to, to strip the cable. It comes with 20 RJ12 connectors so we can make 10 kits. And then of course we have the local net cable and it actually comes with um, both ends already connected. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this opened up and we'll, we'll get started making a cable. I'm not 100% ready to get my command station set where it needs to go yet, but on the back of it, you can see I've got two local net cables to uh, port out. So I'm just gonna set this where it will end up uh, eventually. And I'm gonna go ahead and um, map out where the first cable is gonna go and then we'll go ahead and get it cut to length. Okay, so I got the first local net cable. You can see the black cable run runs above the bus bar and I'm going to come over here and hook it into my LNWI so it's going to plug right into the top here so I've got this pretty much pre marked out where I want it so it's going to go right about here so what I'm going to do so this part of the crimping tool is the cutting cable. So we'll just take and cut this. Perfect. And then this part here, just a little bit above that is the stripping tool. So we'll go ahead and put that in here and strip it. So 
so we can see we got all six wires exposed in there. And now we'll go ahead and get the uh, RJ12 connector and get that installed. Okay, so this is the biggest key when you're making a local net cable. So you can see we have the top prong. What you need to do is you need to make sure that the prong on the opposite end is actually inverted because these are going to be wired one, two, three, four, five, six. So in, in order to make sure wire one is the same on the opposite side, this has to be upside down. So I'm going to hold it like this, go this, move the cable all the way to the end, making sure that it stays the same. So at the other end, the wire was up. Here, I'm gonna make sure the wire is down. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this pushed into the connector. You wanna make sure it goes all the way to the end where those wires are. So it looks like I'm gonna to have to strip just a little bit more of the insulation back to get this to go all the way in. I have about a half inch worth of wire showing here. So again, now we can get that perfect. So it slid, I don't know how well you can see it on the video, it slid all the way to the end. Okay, again, just gonna verify one more time. So on the right end, the clip is down. On the left end, the clip is up. There are three crimping tools on here. There's a 6P for six prong, 8P for eight prong, 4P for four prong. So we're just gonna put this in to the crimper, make sure it's nice and tight. Give it a good crimp, and there we go. We have one local net cable produced. So now we're gonna test this with our LT1 tester to make sure it works properly, and then we're gonna get the rest of the local net cables wired up. Okay, so we got that crimped on. Here's my LT1 tester. Put that on, four LEDs have lit up, so we know this is a good local net cable. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the rest of these uh, cut and installed. Okay, so I got all the local net cables run. So the first one runs out of the back of the DCC system up over to the LNWI. Then I got one over to the UP5, the UP5 up to the BXP88, and then one over here down to the SC8C. So I tested all of them with my LT1 tester and they all worked. So we are ready to go ahead and we're gonna do a track power on for the very first time and we're gonna make sure everything works uh, the way we want it to at this particular point. So before I fire uh, power up to this um, layout, I've unplugged the power connector for that terminal strip. So this is the wire for, or the power supply for the LNWI, this is the power supply, supply for the SCAC. I'm gonna leave those off for a second. This is the power supply for the protothrottle receiver. I don't need those yet, so I'm gonna leave the power off just for the time being. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in. So the command station should power up. You'll probably see the light. There should be a light on the uh, 12, volt 12 volt power supply and I don't have my computer hooked up, so we won't be able to see that, but let's go ahead and plug this in and hopefully we don't get any sizzling. There we go. Okay, so we have power and command station powered up like we were expecting it to. And the um, there's power to the 12 volt power supply. So I'll check the SEAC and the LNWI here in a little bit. Um, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check the track power and make sure that we have power to the layout. So I'm gonna go ahead and power up the track here. So if this is successful, we're gonna see the track status indicator light up, but then there also should be uh, a red LED on my UP5. This button right here, and I know it's hard to see from a distance, but this button right here, the lower left button is the track power. So let's go ahead and hit it. So you can see both of those lit up. So we're gonna go ahead and make sure that we have current to the track. So before we put any locomotives on, I have this handy device and this is an amazing device. It's about $60. Um, it is 
an RR amp meter. It's a railroad amp meter. It's made by DCC Specialties. Um, this thing troubleshoots like crazy uh, any type of voltage issues to your layout. So let's go ahead and, and test this out and make sure that we've got power. Okay, so as you recall, this layout is broken up into sections. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put this on here. I'm not sure how well it's reading on the camera, but it's get it held on nice and tight, 13.9 volts. We'll just keep checking all the rails. 13.9 volts, 13.9 volts, 13.9 volts. So I'm gonna go through and check the rest of the layout here. Um, but original, or the initial test run here is uh, very positive. We got good voltage, about 13.9 volts is what we can expect out of the DCS52 um, command station. It's a three amp command station. So that's the voltage we'd expect on the track. It's gonna, you know, can run about three to four sound locomotives. Um, you know, it, it's a starter system, so it's not gonna be uh, like you would get for, for a, a five or an eight amp uh, DCC uh, command station, but it will more than serve the needs for this particular layout. Okay, one thing we're gonna do, we do wanna test out the SE8C to make sure it works properly. We're gonna get more into this uh, later in the series, but um, this is the test mass that came with the SE8C. In order to test it, you have to have LocoNet hooked up, which we do. We have to have a power supply hooked up, which we do. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug this into port one, which is right here. And we have to make sure that the brown cable, which is to my right, is plugged into pin one, which is the bottom left corner. So we'll go ahead and plug this in. It's a handy little tool here. It's actually kind of nice that Digitrack sends a test mass. So I'm just gonna carefully, just so we can see it and it's held in place, I'm just gonna tuck it in under one of those wires. And we'll go ahead and give this a test here. Okay, so we'll test this out real quick here. I'm gonna switch switch on the, my command station. I'll actually show you the uh, keypad function here in just a second. I'm gonna show you the test here real quick. So uh, switch 257 is the address of, of this particular port. It's currently in a thrown position, so let's go ahead and hit closed. You can see the top one turns to green. So now we'll go 258, which is now in a closed position. We go ahead and hit throw, and that is yellow. And if we close it, it should be flashing yellow. And then if we go 259, thrown, and closed, it'll change the bottom mass to a green. 260 is currently thrown. Let's hit closed. And voila, so let's go back to 259, 257. Okay, so this works, um, and I'll actually show you the uh, keypad command here right now. So if you watch my unboxing of the uh, DCS-52, the Zephyr Express, um, there's a flickering of the keypad that is not visible to the naked eye. It's a frame rate issue with my video, so if you see it flickering, that is not indicative of what you actually see in real life. So let me exit out of the switch here. Um, so what we're going to do to get into the switch mode of this command station, we're gonna hit switch or the S button, top row, middle. Um, I'm just gonna change that back so it's switch one for right now. So we're gonna type in 257. And then on these soft keys, we have thrown and closed. So let's go ahead, it's currently closed. Press throw, it changed it. I'm gonna show you. Changed it to red. Now we'll go ahead and close it. Changes it back to green. So that's the key, key function. So we know our SEHC is working and functioning properly. Sorry, I'm covering up some stuff on my iPhone here. Um, I'm checking to make sure the LNWI works. So this is DTX1, local net server, and these are the serial numbers 1.10.34-7. So I was able to connect to the LNWI just fine. And we'll go ahead, I'm gonna open up my Y throttle and just do a track power here. 
Okay, this is something else I'll get into more later, but this just confirms that the Y throttle is working or the LNWI is working properly because it's connected to my Y throttle. Here's the track power on icon, so I can just go ahead and I'll watch the icon indicator down below. Switch that, track power is now off. Click it, track power back on. So the LNWI is uh, uh, working properly and I was able to access it with my phone, so that's working properly as well. The last two pieces that I um, set up here for this particular part of the, of, of the build series is I still have my, um, and you can see it's lit up like a Christmas tree. I really like what Iowa Scaled Engineering does with their products. They put a lot of LEDs on there and it's really uh, kind of flashy, no pun intended. I need to get my uh, proto throttle out and test that, which is not a big deal. We'll do that later on. And I also need to make sure that the occupancy detection is working on the BXP88 and I need a locomotive to do that and I'm not ready to run a locomotive yet because I want to get my turnouts uh, squared away first. So, and I'm also going to wire up some LEDs for that so I can't really check that yet. I do know that it's working properly because I had track power when I tested it with my amp meter. So I'm confident that's working properly. I'm confident that the proto throttle receiver is working properly. So that's it for um, Part three of my video series, I've got all these modules set up and ready to go. Part four is going to be getting the tortoise switch machines installed and then getting them wired up and then we'll start working on the LED uh, control panel. So things are going along well, coming along well. We're, we're got the basics done and now we're gonna get more into the fine tuning of the layout. So thanks for watching guys, appreciate it.